So now I'd like to uh, hand over to Mr. Uh, Professor Kotake, uh, who is today's moderator. Professor Kotake. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Hibaike. And so now welcome to this uh, third uh, uh, the, uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Naohiko Kotake from Keio University. I'm uh, uh, one of the Australian committee members of uh, March GNSS Agitation, and I'm happy to join this webinar today. And so she already mentioned that we have uh, five presenters, including me, and so they will try to <coughs> presentation related to the uh, smart city. And so the subtitle is Data Driving Smarter Decisions. And I hope you can get several insights from their presentations. And so that today uh, we have a vice kind of uh, presenter from Thailand and Australia and uh, Japan. And so that I, I think the, uh, the participant also uh, from the various countries. And so we can discuss the after presentation. So please uh, describe your uh, question and a comment on the chat. And so I will pick up several uh, comments to the uh, speakers. And so the first session is uh, what's a new recent trend and applications and uh, three presenters. And the first presenter is uh, Dr. Natalie Lawat and so from the Toronto University. And so the uh, Nat San is a wonderful partner uh, from Toronto University. And so the, please have a presentation about your activities. Okay, thank you so much, Kodake uh, Tintes. And uh, hello, everyone. Okay, uh, I'm very happy that I, I have the opportunity to share you about uh, the topic related to the recent trends and application. And I want to share you one application that we did is about SNS social networking services and using GNSS to do something in order to come up with the output of the smart and sustainable tourism business. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm Nadine Lovat from Jalangon University. Uh, actually, my background is industrial engineering, and I'm also working on the data analysis, uh, disaster and risk management. Um, I work with uh, many counterparts in Japan and other Asian countries as well. And because today's assignments that I will be the first presenter of today, so I hope that you enjoy my talk. And because the talk has to be something about the current trend and application, that's why I want to pick one of the current project that I'm doing, and I think it will be interesting for you. It's a project that we from Chuan University uh, work together with the Graduate School of SDM from Keio University in Japan. I think the expertise from our side is uh, social networking analysis, like the Twitter analysis, machine learning, and also artificial intelligence can collaborate with uh, the skill and expertise from KO, which is uh, about GNSS and GIS analysis. And by having this, we also received the support from the JICA ASEAN University Network or AUNCNET with the program called the Special Program for Research Against COVID-19 or SPARK project. We proposed and we got accepted for our project for COVID-19 data analysis using the mobile services data and the satellite geospatial data to a sustainable tourist business. You may wonder what it is. Yes, we have to say that uh, in Thailand and in Japan, right, tourism business is one of uh, the major uh, income of the countries. And uh, due to the lower and decreasing of the traveling fee, uh, comparing with the last decade, I think many people want to travel overseas and go from to discover somewhere that they have no experience before. However, after the COVID-19 situation, as you know that this business have to going down, all the business like the restaurant, hotels, uh, service providers, they cannot keep continue like what they did before. And this is the reason why we want to go on. We focus on both Japan and Thailand. These countries, we pick some of the tourist spots in Japan, like Tokyo, Osaka, uh, Hokkaido, and others. In Thailand, we also pick some, some famous cities like Bangkok, Chiang Mai, Phuket, in order to be some study case. And 
we use the data from the satellite because, uh, as you know, actually now we have many uh, open source and many open data that uh, are available for us to analyze and do some things. We combine it with the Twitter analysis data from uh, those countries as well in order to generate something. But the difficulty is not about how to get the data because it's available for open access online. But the difficulty is what is the algorithm that we can use them to do some things. That is the reason why we have to uh, combine our expertise together from both uh, Jualongkorn University and Kiri University sites. And the goal and point that we want to go on, we want to use this data to indicate some unusual situation in those uh, tourist hotspots. We want to learn the people attitude and intention, both uh, the domestic traveler and the overseas traveler, what will they do? Then we can provide some guideline and recommendation to the government and the tourist agency in order to enhance the sustainable tourism business. So I don't have much time, but I just want to pick some technical algorithm that we use. For example, we use the co-occurrence analysis for Twitter tweets that we already published. You want to learn more, you just check it from this QR code. You can download the paper to read all the details. This one, we can uh, catch up what is the current trend and what is the connection between each tweet and each word that normally people are posting uh, in their daily life. We also use the Twitter sentiment analysis. Uh, this technique is the part that we want to learn people feel positive, negative, or feel neutral with uh, the tourist perspective in some area. We published our first paper for Bangkok tourism, and we are going to publish other papers in other areas later on. And lastly, we also published a paper by using the GNS data to analyze the chain of some Gas. We pick the nitrogen dioxide gas because it can monitor some human behavior or human activities. And we try to match this chain of the nitrogen dioxide together with the activity related to COVID-19 response from the government in uh, one province in Thailand. And we also found that they have some significant relationship as well. So I think uh, we, what, what I want to convey to you is that we can find out and collaborate the multidisciplinary knowledge and discipline, not only one way, but you can combine tools or three expertise, then you can come up with something that uh, it can produce impact, not only for that field, but we, and we also can produce to an other variety field. Uh, I think this example is one of the achievements that our team received because we also won the Best Paper Award from the IEEE's uh, ICA Symposium Conference due to our contribution and the impact of uh, this research. Not just learning what data tell, but we also can create some contribution of those data analysis to policy or to the implementation in the future. Okay, I think the message, the last message from my short talk is that try to think of what you have and try to catch something that you don't have, but maybe your friends know and your friend have those skills, then you combine together, you can create the synergy and that one can make your plan or your proposal success. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Very good presentation. But uh, I think this is a very limited time. And yeah, thank you very much. And so the second presenter is uh, Dr. Uh, Akira Kodaka from Kyo University. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so please turn on the uh, mic, microphone. Relax. Relax. <laughs> so yeah, I'm muted. Thank you very much, Kotaka Sensei. So my name is Akira from the Keio University. Uh, technically, I'm working under the Professor Kotake at the um, Grad School of System Design and Management. And I'd like to talk about uh, smart city and especially disaster risk reduction. And we are saying like Taylor made it disaster responses based on like people who what we want to help 
like where and who and when. Like this is a telemated disaster risk reduction and the countermeasures based on location uh, based data. Okay. So the target issue here, uh, as we know that our society is now getting very much complicated as well. So um, this is an example of the photo. So the, it's a platform of the train station and maybe um, like rush hour in the morning commuting time is congested with the people, but at the same place, but maybe during afternoon, like one or 2 p.m., there are not many, much people. The thing is, even we're seeing the same place, but the dynamic, dynamic or people who are very much different along with the time and as, as well as the season itself. The point is a disaster risk is very much complicated and more much of like dynamic. And the gap is the static response. Now we have, especially in Tokyo that we I'm going to talk about a little bit in detail. They have like very, very limited data and decision-making material. So the response of their responses are very much static. So we are trying to fill this gap to make static government responses to make it as a dynamic, to tailor made about the actual situation in the city dynamics. And also we are working together with uh, the project, also uh, uh, Dr. Nat as well. So I think this video will be shared later. So um, maybe detailed information you can refer to this, the URL written in the below. But the uh, big umbrella, we're working together under the Belmont Forum and collaborative research action. And especially the Japan and Taiwan, and also we have a USA team. So we're collaborating with the university and the local governments and stakeholders to fill the gap that I mentioned previous slide. And this is an area of interest. USA, the Penn Station, Grand Central Station, and Tokyo here, a Tokyo Station and Taiwan's Taipei Station. So I'd like to go a little bit details in the area around the Tokyo Station, which is we call a little long, Maruno Ichi Omo, uh, sorry, Otemachi and Yurakuchi area. So this area is known as uh, one of the largest district. It's around the Tokyo Station and has about 120 hectares and thing is, it has 13 stations there and 28 lines. And also it's creating like 10% of entire sales in Japan. So it's like a business district as well as a tourist place as well. And this area is designated as one of the prototype area of the Tokyo city, um, smart Tokyo leading area. The keywords are API, society 5.0, digital train city, or these things. So the government and local uh, entities related to disaster risk reduction is trying to get it as like um, real time uh, decision making by using the data that are available from this area and other area as well using also open uh, data. So this is uh, what we are doing. So the first of all, uh, we are using the data source as the mobile phones. We're collaborating with the Yahoo Japan. So we are also using the location data and the people are like searching queries, what kind of keywords that they are searching. And this is, and also SNS tweets as Ajahn mentioned, and also some open data of the weathers and person trade data and these things. So. And then we're trying to put it in as a population density distribution map and the 2D maps like this. And also focusing on a specific point and we draw like a histogram. So which time the people are more in there and when it, the density gets lower. So for example, about in the morning times, about seven-ish, people are more using this area. And then later on about six, when the people going back to the home, maybe the station gets clouded again. So this dynamicity we draw using the data available. And then we make it as a model, so like a pattern. So there's various and thousands of patterns, but we need to focus on something very serious patterns or very major patterns out of this people flow analysis. And they overlapped with a, a hazard scenario, for example, a fire or flood or earthquake and overlay with the city dynamics and the hazard map, then we can create something about the simulation of the hazard or the risk scenario. So based on this risk scenario, we can provide or propose to the government or who are responsible in the disaster risk reduction. 
So by using data-driven analysis, we are proposing something like the dynamic disaster response. So this is our concept. And others are complemental open data source. So this is the general transit uh, field specification developed by the Google. So we not only just the people flow, but also we can use a uh, public vehicle um, movement of flow. And once this is um, uh, Manhattan area, and once we make it as a heat map, so we can see like during eight and 9 a.m. in the Manhattan area, which part that the buses are congested. So like this the special distribution, also we can use it to understand dynamicity of the risks. And this is a further advanced, but not that far challenges that also not just only the people flow, but also depend on the area and what kind of keywords that they are searching. And then by like text mining technologies or the big data analysis, then we can kind of extract the disaster needs out of this, the people searching behaviors. And also to knowing about uh, their demographic data or like the behavior patterns of how, how to use a mobile phone then based on this demographic data, we can kind of categorize it as to tailor me what kind of information that this person would know. For example, if we can know about the people who have routine diagnosis with a doctor, then once disaster happened, maybe you can provide something about the ed ed uh, medical uh, supports to this person, like this kind of real-time decision-making. We are hoping to help out of this, our project. Okay, so this is it. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting presentations. And so please send some uh, question or comment on the chat. Okay, and the final presenter in this session is the Mr. Peter Knight from Australian Trade and Investment Commission in Japan. Yeah, please. Peter, thank please. you very much. Um, if the secretary could put the slides up. Thank you. If you could move to the first slide. Thank you. So I'd like to talk about two things from an Australian perspective. Uh, the first is uh, how we're uh, building in uh, satellite data and imagery into smart city development. And the second is around uh, how to build resilience in those systems, and in particular, uh, in regards to uh, disaster and emergency signaling systems, uh, some of the tests that we've been conducting very recently, along with Japan on the QZSS emergency warning system and how it could be applied in Australia. But if I can first talk about uh, the smart infrastructure uh, strategy that's been applied for the development of Sydney, one of the largest smart city uh, precinct developments in Australia and possibly even the world is uh, in the Western Parkland city of uh, uh, the Sydney area. Uh, essentially, that is a city about the size of Dallas that's being planned to build out uh, over the next two decades with about uh, well, over a million and a half new households being created, a new uh, airtropolis area with uh, uh, Western Sydney airport being the catalyst for that growth. So there is some major infrastructure development that's being planned for that. And to assist in the planning, uh, we've been rolling out uh, a series of initiatives in how to use uh, uh, digital twin modeling in to, to assist in the planning and development process. Uh, this is being captured in an, uh, a number of policy re releases that are being done in New South Wales uh, with the uh, infrastructure data management framework being uh, released last year, along with a spatial collaboration portal, which was launched in February uh, 2020. Uh, these are being coordinated with the federal government uh, and uh, in particular, the uh, Geoscience Australia and the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organizations, uh, Data61, which uh, focuses on its uh, spatial services have been key partners to the state government in uh, developing this platform. Uh, the New South Wales Digital Twin, uh, which I mentioned was released in February 2020, uh, will focus on creating models for the uh, planning and then delivery 
in the Western Sydney area. Um, and uh, those models will be built incorporating both uh, remote sensing data from uh, satellite services, as well as incorporating um, IoT uh, sensory uh, networks into the infrastructure itself. Uh, in order to assist with this, uh, the government has uh, developed a series of policy and guidelines for how that infrastructure should be incorporated. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a model of how we see that um, system working. So as you can see at the base level of data input, um, remote sensing data will be a core component of that. That will then be aggregated up and we are creating a governance system for the standardization of uh, data that will be incorporated into building information models. And this will uh, support the uh, development of those models within digital twins. The vision that we have is that there will be smart delivery where a infrastructure company, when it uh, completes a, a major project such as a bridge or a road, will not only deliver that physical infrastructure to the government, but will also deliver a digital twin of that infrastructure that will be uh, able to operate in real time and be updated as the infrastructure is being used to optimize the use of that asset and to uh, ensure that things like predictive maintenance could be done on those uh, infrastructure for smart cities. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. Just to emphasize, um, for us, smart cities are not just about the city itself, but about the infrastructure that is being built out uh, using uh, the same kind of smart grid platforms and regional data. Uh, as you can see here, we have a, a plan to develop these hubs throughout uh, the state of New South Wales. Um, one of the, the key issues there is the vulnerability of this infrastructure to uh, bushfires in particular. As everyone probably knows, we, we suffered from major uh, bushfires throughout Australia and, and particularly in New South Wales. In order to try and strengthen the system, which at the moment relies on a uh, terrestrial based uh, telephony uh, emergency warning system, we are looking to collaborate with the Japanese government uh, to uh, have uh, satellite based emergency warning systems. Uh, the Japanese QZSS system has a very robust platform. Uh, and in August last year, New South Wales Rural Fire Services conducted uh, a test of that uh, system by uploading uh, a message through uh, the NSPS to uh, be broadcast by QZSS. We, we successfully received that at those emergency signals. Um, and we would see this as a first trial. Uh, we will, are looking later this year to a report that will uh, recommend how we can upgrade uh, the national emergency warning system for Australia. Uh, we would look to do that in a way that is compatible with international standards. And we think there's a great opportunity to work with uh, the Japanese governments and with uh, other countries in the region to roll out uh, satellite-based uh, emergency warning uh, systems. Um, so we're, we're very keen to collaborate when it comes to both the incorporation of satellite data into our smart city development, as well as into our emergency warning systems and preparation. Uh, we'd be delighted to answer any questions about how we're looking to do that uh, in the end of this session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> and so, yeah, this is an actual uh, real project in Australia. So I'm interested in this early warning system. Okay, so the, let's move to the next session. Next session is a FATS uh, technology behind lessons learned from MG experts. And so the two presenters and uh, uh, one presenter is Dr. Damrongit uh, Niamad and uh, me. And so the first, uh, I will have a presentation. And so the uh, next is uh, Dr. Damrongit. Okay, oh, hello, Dr. Damrongit. Yeah, uh, I will have a presentation before you, and after that, so please have a presentation. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, and so I, I will show several uh, examples uh, related to the M MG, uh, uh, GNSS applications. And first one is uh, agricultures. And so the, uh, so this is an actual uh, research project. And also the currently the company is using this technology for their process improvement. And so the, our target field is the <coughs> uh, big field uh, plantations. And so the, uh, one of the problem is the, uh, uh, the precise positioning for the replanting. And so the uh, country pro uh, problem in the conventional replanting method is low efficiency and low productivity. And so the company asked us to improve this point. And so the, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, our study and uh, uh, left side is uh, the uh, previous uh, processes. So they use the uh, manual based land survey. And so the, the country we are applying the RTK March GNSS for the precise positioning. So we can apply the GNSS technologies. And so the, this is the, uh, the prototyping. And so you can see some small sounds. So in this system, so the, uh, the this system tried to use a, a March Genesis RTK, and so we use a March uh, first kind of Genesis satellite. And then the outside, so that sometimes it's difficult to see the display. Then so we use not only display but also sounds, and the worker can realize the precise the target point with the sound and the, uh, the visuals. So then this is a, a prototype, but uh, the most important point is the usability and the user experience because this system is a little bit complicated technical system. And so we have a many uh, trial and discussion with the workers and the users. So this discussion and observation is very important. And then so the finally we uh, discuss that we uh, make an image of the uh, new uh, smart uh, suits for the precise positioning. This is a very fun and enjoyable and very small uh, smart uh, looks. And so the currently we can use uh, uh, 3D printers and many, uh, how can I say, prototyping tool. Then, so, so this is a uh, system uh, architectures and so that we try to make this kind of system with the 3D printers. And so we can uh, realize in uh, one month. So this quick prototyping is very important for realize uh, new technologies. Then, so this is a prototype. And so the worker, uh, you can see the smile looks. And so this, how can I say the feeling is very important, not only technical uh, the aspect, but also the how can I say the feeling is very important to uh, create a new start, start a new services. And sports case, and so that we are trying to use a GNSS system for the various kind of outdoor sports because the people are using the March GNSS devices on the back. So this is a current trend. And so the, uh, with the uh, March GNSS technology, we can realize uh, uh, precise positioning. So we can compare the positioning, uh, the, the GNSS and a March GNSS. And the other one is a positioning with March GNSS. In this case, we use uh, uh, US GPS, China Beidou, and the Japan QZSS. And you can see that this is a very, very precise. And so we can use this uh, system on the actual outdoor sports like this. And so the uh, left side is the data from March GNSS and the right side is a visual uh, feedback on the camera. And so only with the GNSS data, we can analyze the many uh, uh, performance of the athlete. And sorry for Japanese, but you can uh, understand the, the total distance and the speed and also we can apply some physical sensors and then we can estimate their uh, injuries. And so the benefit of this kind of technology is prevention of injuries. And we can communicate with the various stakeholder with this uh, technical data. 
And so that, as you may know, the March GNSS, we can uh, receive this signal all over the world. And so we can expand this lessons learned from Japan to the outside uh, the countries. And so we can supporting the Asian countries. So this is a national team of Indonesia. And one of the point is the cost down and high reliability. And so that now we have a small ventures and so the country also we realize the cost down. So this sports device is less than $100. So this is a very cheap for the sports people. Yeah, so this is a very, very new system. And we use the uh, U-Brox uh, receivers. And also the combination with technological data and uh, visual data is very important. And so we are developing a new uh, sports analytics tool with the Fujitsu company, Japanese IT company. So this is a new system and the crowd base and any uh, team and the high school team and the university team also using this system. And uh, finally, livestock. And so that we have various kind of uh, experience with the uh, athlete and the workers. And uh, this means the humans, but uh, we can apply this system on the animal like the cow because the condition management is very important in our livestock. And so we are applying the March GNSS de uh, devices, all uh, the animals, rockies. And so we can manage the condition. And so sometimes we can support these animals with this data. And uh, this condition is very important. And so, yeah, I want to say that uh, technology is very important, but uh, the service user uh, is interesting in not only technical uh, originality and uniqueness, but also the service value. Then, so the usability and the communication and the user interface and also business model is very important. So this is a key uh, comment to the audience. Thank you very much. Okay, and so the final presenter is the Dr. Uh, Damrongit from uh, Jista, Thailand. So may I ask her the presentation, Damrongit? Yeah, thank you for your introduction. Yeah, thank you. You see my screen, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So the, my topic is um, smart city in the post-COVID era. Um, my name is Damrit uh, Nimur, the acting deputy executive director of Jista Thailand. Um, my topic is quite big, but I will make it in short. Um, as you may know, COVID-19 crisis and um, smart city seems to be go along together in, 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 in this period of, of time. Um, uh, you can see that impact of COVID-19 make some experience of uh, isolation and uh, lack of uh, connectedness between cities and also countries. Um, as you may know, there are a lot of definitions um, in terms of smart cities. And before we think, we, many people believe that, a lot of people believe that the smart city is something nice to have. But uh, in this period, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, we believe in, especially in Thailand, we believe in the resilience to the uh, situation and uh, the integration of physical and digital environment is something that we need um, to cope and um, uh, the solution is needed for, for this kind of, of uh, uh, situation. Uh, you can see from, from the screen, um, the, a lot of technologies drive uh, smart cities and we have to think about uh, the new way uh, of making connections uh, between people in, in this uh, um, uh, in this situation is something very difficult. Um, especially in Thailand at national level, we are trying to use the 
uh, technologies um, uh, for the solution of uh, trying to monitor and managing many things for the, for the situation. Um, on the top right, uh, you, uh, we use the system for managing the lockdown, um, ensuring con uh, um, co uh, the connectivities, and also this connectivity uh, represents something for the economic stability also. We cannot lock all the system, I mean the human activities, <clears throat> and uh, ignore all the activities of humans. And also the, the system is that we are looking for in Thailand is to manage the reopening and compensation. Also, the, we trying to use the system uh, to setting up the health facilities. This is something that uh, we make it in Thailand. We prepare all the things if the situation is bigger than we think. But on the on the the base uh, on, on the how I say the 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 ground and uh, <clears throat> the information that we need is not only the uh, geoinformatics. It's something we call citizen applications and government data combining together for uh, the analytics. What I'm trying to to say is, uh, this data create something called IMAP for the prevention and imitate, uh, then, uh, mitigation on the pandemics at the national level. And this is, as, as I mentioned, we have the, uh, the government uh, issue many citizen applications and all the data of the government pull together, integrate in, in the system to show, to manage and mitigate all the the uh, the event. This is what what we're trying to do at the national level, and we're trying to scope down to the city level. Um, you can see the number on the screen is the what we have like the uh, health facilities. And um, in Thailand, we have the um, announcement. Uh, every day by the center of COVID-19 uh, situation administration and the government used the system by TISDA to show to the public the situations and how the government mitigate all the, the events. And uh, right now TISDA trying to scope down to the city level <clears throat> to uh, manage at the city level and uh, trying to reopen uh, in, 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 in national level. What I'm trying to say is the, the, the post COVID era is trying, uh, is something that the smart city will be transformed to. The example in Thailand is the Phuket city. The P Phuket city uh, ex express their willingness for uh, the smart city to be in three key areas. Uh, epidemic disease, crimes, and environmental threats. And uh, this is also the opportunities for our com uh, community to share our experience to what the smart city will be show in the near future. And also I would like to, the, almost my last slide, the, we can, uh, uh, I show the um, analysis uh, of the talent gap of digital skill in Thailand. Uh, you can see from this slide that a lot of the gap in Thailand in data analytics, um, software application developer and an an analytics, uh, um, analysis. This is the way that we believe that is opening up for collaboration with partners, not, not in, in the, the far away future, but I think right now the pa the pandemic uh, accelerate all the activities of analytics and smart city and transform the smart city in the way that the uh, people think that is something we need 
to do it right now. In conclusion, I believe that Smart City in post-COVID era is the opportunity for us to direct and steer transformation focus for all the smart cities. Uh, we, th this kind of situation is an opportunity to improve and share digital connectivity between government agencies, business sector, and citizen data. This is the case of Thailand that uh, government agencies, uh, to, to get into the government agency and citizen data is not that easy, but this uh, pandemic uh, um, situation we can get all the data pool, pooling together and we can work all the data with their willingness. We also learn a lot of human experience with uh, a lot of new applications uh, from the government. We have many applications from the government uh, for the pandemic uh, situation. And uh, what we learn is how the uh, Thai people uh, get into all that applications also. And the last thing that I, I think is something that we, the community, our community can respond to is the collaboration for solutions um, that we can uh, show and uh, demonstrate to the smart cities. And uh, the goal of, uh, with the goal of recovery and economic uh, sustainability in the very near future. I think this is something that uh, the smart city need to be and our community can respond to. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Damrongit. Yeah, yeah I understand the uh, situation in Thailand. Okay, uh, thank you very much for five presenters again. And so that now uh, uh, we will move to the open discussion with Q&A. And so the, yeah, I will moderate these uh, discussions on about 10 minutes. And so now I have several questions from the participants. And first uh, question is to Dr. Kodaka. And how much does location affect the response system? Oh. So may I ask to have comments? Oh, thank you very much. Um, how much does location affects the response system? So my understanding towards this question is um, how the location information contributes to strengthen the disaster response system. I'm not sure I'm understanding correctly about the questions. Yeah, but location itself, uh, we, what I wanted to uh, share with you today it's a location, for example, when we talk about it, just only in Tokyo area, but the people's density. So it's not just only one, but like the crowd of the people flow. And when we map it, then during the morning time, maybe the people are more in, inside of the Tokyo station and surrounding area. So once disaster happens, maybe people will be confined within the Tokyo station area. So the government will think about it once disaster happens in this period of time, what kind of preparation that they need beforehand or what kind of agreement that they have to made it within or among the stakeholders. So location is like uh, risks also can be changed along with the location. Also somewhere in Tokyo, also they have a wooden based buildings are there. So their fire risks are high. And if the people are there at some point, and then when we think about a disaster scenario at that period of time, when the people are getting together around this the vulnerable buildings, then people may think about the firefighters should be going the place, not taking a long time. So this is kind of location-based uh, scenario that we create and then think about the disaster preparation along with the dynamic or city dynamics of the real world. Uh, I hope I has answered that question. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. And so there are two more questions and the two question is to me. And so the first question is GNSS and the cow is very interesting a connection. And uh, what is a uh, uh, relation between uh, condition management of cow and GNSS data? 
I want to know in more detail. Okay, thank you very much. And so the, uh, this uh, session is very uh, related to the uh, Genesis application for the uh, athlete, rugby players, because the uh, cow uh, is on the field and a very a big field. And, but uh, the uh, cow manager cannot check the condition of the cow because the, sometimes the cow is uh, uh, far away. And so the, on the GNSS receiver and uh, uh, the uh, condition sensors, so they can get their uh, data uh, via uh, network and anytime so the, the, the manager can uh, realize the, their condition with GNSS data and uh, condition data. Then sometimes if they have some uh, uh, the irregular uh, trend of the data, and so the, uh, the cow manager uh, contact to the target cow, then so they can uh, prevent injuries and they can support the cow. So health care is one of the uh, application with GNSS. And so additionally, and in our case, we are monitoring the condition on the uh, ground grass with the remote sensing data. With the remote sensing data so that we can uh, understand the condition of the grasses. So cow is eating the grass. And so we can control the cow and uh, uh, on, on the ground field. So this is a very smart um, cultures. And second, uh, with regards to the GPS, can we apply also the plants on what commodities are available in this area? Ah, okay. So the, now the GNSS technology is becoming a much more uh, commodity and high reliability. And so there are many uh, GNSS receiver and the tools for the agriculture and the outside. So you can search the Google and so you can buy some uh, GNSS devices. And if you cannot find the GNSS uh, devices, so please contact to the Japanese cabinet office and also uh, us, we are uh, GNSS expert. And so the very uh, uh, the, uh, cheap uh, receivers, it takes about, how can I say, uh, uh, 0 0.5 or 0 0.3, uh, uh, no, 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 uh, about 30 US dollars about, and it's not uh, expensive. <laughs> so you can try this system. And any other question or comments? Oh, one more. Uh, okay. Thank you. Can we go? This is okay. Maybe. Uh, okay. Yeah. New uh, comments and the question. Thank you very much. And okay. So, does a post COVID smart city application in Thailand already have more specific? features such as citizen profiling, what data can be accessed by the public uh, automating some government processes? Maybe this is a question to the Dr. Damrongit and uh, uh, Dr. Nat Liwat. May I ask uh, to the Dr. Damrongit? Um, I think the, some data can be accessed by the public the i think that the most difficult things um for uh, the i mean how can i say the data to be accessed is the private data we the government agencies get into the day uh, the, the that kind of the how i say private data because of this spatial situation and we cannot show all the personal private data to the public we show to the public with the all the analyzed things to the public. Um, I think in Thailand, this is something the issue that we have to learn and, and adapt in the in the future. The, the things that we have to to discuss about private, I mean personal private data, and uh, I think it's is something that uh, uh, I think like in Thailand before we cannot even think about these kind of things, but this kind of the COVID situation, we can get the data and we can analyze. And I think in the near future, the, um, we have to talk about this. And I think it, it, in many countries also. 
Yeah, okay, thank you very much. And so, yeah, I, I want to have same question to the uh, Peter Knight uh, because that he knows the Australian case. But before that, I have, uh, I want to ask several comments from Dr. Nat Vivot. Do you have any additional comments about this question? Yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Damlongwit that uh, due to the less experience in Thailand that we did not uh, have much uh, experience in terms of pandemics comparing with other countries. And in terms of uh, less awareness, I can say that we did not have much awareness like in Japan in terms of the privacy and personal information. That's why uh, lately we uh, the government also issued some of the new acts that link to those privacies and Similar to what Dr. Damluk already mentioned that yeah, the, the data for all the confusion data and uh, personal data will not be provided to the public. But what we can see is mostly already analyzed data. When, when we go back to see some uh, other country previous uh, published paper like from Japan, from Singapore and other country, yes, they also recommend that all this data should be highly uh, collected with only the authorized people that can be seen because uh, after the pandemic passed, if this data is still available, it can show somehow the information leak to the societies. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. And so the Mr. Peter Knight, may I have a question about the same, what data can be accessed by public automating some government processes? Uh, so actually, in the applications that we were talking about with uh, digital twins for design, uh, the uh, data access challenge is slightly different. Um, most of the access, most of the uh, visualization of infrastructure uh, is available to the public, but uh, where it's dealing with sensitive infrastructure, such as uh, where particular pipes run or uh, where cables go. Uh, where telecommunications infrastructure is, uh, access to that is staged. So depending on your level of participation in the digital twin, um, if you are uh, a contractor who it needs to know where that infrastructure is in order to uh, build and uh, carry out construction, uh, then you are given uh, different access rights. For the general public, though, um, there's an ability to be able to uh, see the, the visualization of that digital twin data and and be able to kind of step uh, uh, sort of do fly throughs the mo with the models. Um, in in regards to uh, other data that would be gathered, not necessarily from remote sensing, but uh, potentially from IoT. Uh, similarly, uh, we would have sort of uh, levels of access to that. So uh, for things like uh, crowd data. Uh, uh, looking at uh, the flow through of traffic in stations and that kind of data, where it is anonymous, it would be public, or where it is personal, then it would uh, be pri kept private. And actually, a lot of the government policies relate to um, ensuring uh, good cybersecurity practices uh, to ensure that uh, infrastructure data is, is kept anonymous. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Very detailed comments. Mm. Okay, and uh, so the, any other question or comment? Okay, no questions from the audience. And uh, I have one question to the uh, Dr. Nat Leewood, to the other presenters. May I ask some comments? Nat san Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I, I think what, what, what we learned today is that yeah, from variety of field, we, we, we can learn the application and the existing platform technology that have been developed. So, so I actually, I, I have not, not kind of comment, but like some, some question in, in terms of techni technical terms, uh, no, technical specification that uh, the current situation of the GNSS is still related to the satellite signaling and connectivity, right? Therefore, I, I want, actually, I want to ask all of you that, is it possible that we can use GNSS for something that is like underground or indoor areas for the current technology that we have? Uh, okay. Any question, comments from the other presenters? Indoor positioning? 
Yeah, I have uh, uh, some uh, comments. And so the country, the, as you may know, the uh, satellite signal uh, cannot uh, be received uh, indoor. And so, yeah, we can receive the uh, signal, but the march pass and the other, uh, how can I say, the noise is also included uh, signals. Then it is very difficult to the satellite portion in, indoor. However, that we have existing other technologies like uh, wireless network and uh, Bluetooth. And so the, uh, the current technology, we can combine the satellite uh, signal and other signals. And the combination is very important for the uh, seamless positioning uh, indoor and outdoors. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, thank you very much for the presenters and thank you very much for the very uh, good questions from the uh, audience. And currently the 50 participant is joining this uh, webinars. And uh, yeah, this is a very good uh, numbers, I think. Okay, and thank you very much. And right now the almost 7 p.m. And I will move to the, this discussion to the uh, coordinators again. Yeah, thank you very much presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all our special guests for uh, your great presentation. Okay, now I'd like, uh, I'd like everyone to announce some uh, upcoming events. Uh, I now I introduce you Esposta. Esposta is a space-based business idea contest hosted by the Cabinet Office of Japan. Additional part value of this contest is the support to finalists by providing monitoring program to brush up their business ideas. Applications open to Asia and Oceania region. At the final round, presentations are held in front of inventors, large companies, and etc. to promote business matching. If you if your ideal event ground flies, you would get 10 million yen. Okay, uh, let's see a promotion video about S Booster for one minute. Put the most advanced space technology into your hands. Apply satellite data. We can help realize your dream. You can polish your business ideas together with experts who will provide the strong backup you need for success. S-Booster is hosted by the Cabinet Office of Japan with the support of JAXA and others. Startups from Japan, Asia and Oceania compete against each other. You can be the next winner. Space is no longer far away. Draw closer to and pioneer a new business area. S-Booster will accelerate the realization of your dream. Okay, so for additional information, you can also see detailed promotion video on the website. Okay, now I'd like to uh, explain about the program a little bit. Uh, application team has two items. The first is business idea for utilizing space asset in collaboration with Japan. It example are collaboration with Japanese companies or utilization of Japanese space asset. Another uh, team is business idea for team by sponsors. Uh, entry about the schedule. Uh, entry of business idea is scheduled in this spring. The clarifying is conducted in Japan and Asia round, uh, respectively. Uh, the final round will be held in December. Method to participate will be, on, uh, will be online for some uh, contestants because of the COVID-19. You can get detailed information on the website, which is announced in late May, uh, late March, sorry. So that's, that's all for uh, that's all for uh, that's all about Esposta. Uh, you can check uh, this uh, website for more detailed information. <laughs>